after being in Seoul for a few days now, it is really, really hard to grasp that we're just 60 kilometers away from one of the most militarized borders on planet Earth. Honestly, being here in the city, you wouldn't know that there's any tension at all with North Korea. But today we're gonna to head out of the city up to the DMZ, which is the militarized area along the 68th parallel, which is the border between the two countries. And we're going to have a look at North Korea and find out a little bit more about what happened here during the Korean War and what potentially could happen in the future. Being so highly guarded and with tensions running so high, you can't just go to the DMZ to have a look around yourself. Every single person has to book a tour that takes you there on a bus. So we found our tour guide and hopped on our bus and headed north out of the city. Whilst we drive out of Seoul and towards the DMZ, let's give you a little background on how the situation got here in the first place. To explain how the entire thing started and the DMZ came into existence, we need to go back to World War II and on the 15th of August 1945, the US and the USSR liberated the Korean Peninsula following the surrender of Japan and effectively ended 35 years of colonization. But following the end of the war, they swiftly divided the Korean Peninsula into two zones of occupation. And after World War II ended, the Cold War was heating up. And as the two superpowers jostled for influence and control over the world, tensions on the divided Korean Peninsula were heating up too. An all-out war began on the 25th of June 1950 when the Soviet and China-backed North Korea invaded the Western and UN-backed South. Following this, a bloody war was fought over three long years from 1950 to 1953, claiming approximately three million lives. And it wasn't until the 27th of July 1953, over three years later, that the combat finally ceased with an armistice agreement. This phrasing in particular is key, as it wasn't a peace deal, but just an armistice agreement, which created the Korean Demilitarized Zone, or the DMZ, as the new border to separate North and South Korea, and paused all combat on the peninsula, allowing for the exchange of prisoners and room for a resolution to be found. But actually, to this day, no formal peace treaty has ever been signed, which means officially the two Koreas are still at war today, and are currently engaged in a frozen conflict of which the heavily fortified DMZ is the front line. The tour we're on has a few stops, with the first being the Bridge of Freedom. This is the bridge where the prisoners of war were exchanged during the Korean Wars. And it was here we got our first glimpse of the reality of something you hear about so often, but often feels a world away. The truth is, as always, it's the average people that suffer from conflicts and the battles on the Korean Peninsula broke apart a nation. Infrastructure such as this train track were destroyed, but worst of all, entire families were separated and still are today. So the bridge we're standing on right now is one of the last bits of railway in South Korea and there's a station there called Dorasan Station which is the very last station in South Korea. But if it wasn't for the separation of the two Koreas then this train could go all the way through what is now North Korea into China, Mongolia, Russia and all the way into Europe. So at the moment South Korea is effectively like an island. It's shut off from the rest of the Eurasian landmass and you can only get to the rest of Eurasia by flight or boat. families were separated during that time and some ended up obviously on the northern side and some on the southern. So this park was built for people on this side to come here and feel closer to their relatives and especially they come here during holidays um, to reflect and send their wishes to the other side of the family and just feel their presence. But 
the younger generation is a bit different. They don't have any connection to the other side. They don't know any people there. So for them, the amusement park was built. So when the older generation come here, they sort of they go through all the emotions and they cry, but the younger generation comes to enjoy the amusement park. Our second stop is the third tunnel complex. This tunnel along with four others were discovered in 1978, stretching almost 500 meters into the southern half of the DMZ. It was built from deep within North Korean control. These tunnels were part of an elaborate and daring plan to reinvade the south by cutting underneath the front line and making a dash towards Seoul. This tunnel in particular was said to have been discovered from a tip-off given from a North Korean defector. And to this day, it's suspected there could be up to 20 of these along the line of contact, with only four discovered so far. You can actually go inside the tunnel to have a look around. And everybody went. I chose not to go. It's 15 minutes one way and then 15 minutes the other. Even though there is enough space for me not to crouch down, just not a big fan of tunnels. And you're not allowed to film there or take any pictures. So I'm just gonna have a walk around here and wait for them to come up and tell me what it was like. Interesting that North Korea dug these tunnels out to invade South Korea. But South Korea is making money actually on those tunnels by taking tourists here and showing everyone around. That was quick. How was it? Winners. That was difficult. We were just saying, imagine the fact that they built these tunnels down the bottom. Unfortunately, we can't show inside, but they built this entire tunnels and then you still have to come up the other side, up an incline like that, 11%. And then, I mean, the idea being that it would be wartime, you then go into battle. I mean, I don't know about you, I'm ready to sleep. <laughs> you have to carry everything. With yeah, you, like... yeah. I mean, insane. The conditions that must have been down there to, to build those tunnels is just hard to fathom, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, I was once with the head. Yeah. Mm. Thank God, we Oh, you had helmets? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, PPE as well. Also, there is a military base near, around here. We're obviously not allowed to show it. But basically, people are here to win time and to protect Seoul. But if anything did happen, it wouldn't be a long battle. They would lose their life pretty quick. Yeah, this is just the first line of first line of defense between yeah. between the border and then the remainder of the troops that would be sent back to protect the capital. So yeah, I mean, it's pretty. It will, the guide was saying, Henry, that basically no one wants to be stationed here because mm -hmm. this is the front line where you're pretty much guaranteed to, you know, to lose yeah, your you life. You're just slowing happen, yeah. down time. Yeah. So I feel a little bit like a professional spy, but with these telescopes you can see into North Korean territory and um, you can see people working in the rice fields down below, you can see a tractor moving and uh, yeah you can see all the way to the city of Gaesong as well. Um, yeah really interesting just to, even through these, to have a look at, at normal life on the other side of the border. It's really strange as well that that's the only way we can sort of get to these yes, people I mean, just looking for a telescope. It is, it's, it's a sad, sad fact as well, right? That, uh, the world's been reduced to, to looking at countries through telescopes <laughs> on a hill four kilometers away. But yeah, for now, it's as close we're getting. As we're looking over the border, you may have noticed the two Korea's flags within a few kilometers of one another. During the 1980s, these became famous for a bizarre episode of My Flagpole's Bigger Than Yours. The South Korean government started proceedings building a 97-meter flagpole in its border village of Daesong-dong, 
which is the one you can see here. And the North Koreans promptly responded by building this 160 meter flagpole in its border town. Also somewhere out there is the fake city of Gijongdong, which is also known as the Propaganda Village. This was built in the 1950s by the North in an effort to encourage South Korean defection by showing how amazing life was on the other side of the border. From up here at the observatory, it's actually puts in perspective how close the two countries are. And maybe that sounds a bit weird, but we can literally see Seoul from here. The outskirts of Seoul are literally right there. And the border is two kilometers away from us here. And these two sets of people that are effectively the same people are so divided in so many ways. I mean, just the physical border itself separates two different worlds completely two different perspectives on life, two different political systems, but once again, one people. And yeah, really seeing it from this height shows the, shows the scale of the tragedy, I think, of the separation of the Korean Peninsula. And yeah, as I said, we can see Gaesong just here, right in front of us is Gaesong, North Korean town, maybe as the crow flies, 10 kilometers away, and then Seoul. 30, 40 kilometers away. <sighs> Crazy. So, as always, to be honest with travel, when you go to a place and see something with your own eyes, you often walk away with more questions than answers and more curiosities than answers. And to be honest, yeah, the curiosity about the country to the north of that border is just massive. I can't explain how much, how curious we are. So much we don't know, so much you want to see with your own eyes and try and understand. And um, yeah, as weird as it may seem, I would really like to, from the perspective of a traveler, go and see it. You know, going through this footage and unintentionally putting myself back to being on this border and hearing Matt saying all this makes me sad to the core of my soul. Why is it it seems the ones who fight the most are the ones that are most similar to one another? The situation in Korea is unique in a way, but on the other side is just one of too many conflicts just like that around the world. How is it that we can be so easily manipulated by outside forces that friends, colleagues and entire families can end up turning and fighting one another? Maybe I'm naive, but I'm just a bit tired of everything being so twisted and complicated and fear of each other constantly seeming to win out. Anyways, that's just a few thoughts that I had while editing this video and revisiting this place myself. We are back in Seoul after what's been an incredibly intriguing day and I can't really believe that we're only 40 minutes away from the border because when you're here it feels like you're literally a world away and as Matt said we just left with more questions and want to find out a lot more It's like that don't come around often and we could miss it this time and we really wanted to bring you along with us <laughs> Welcome to the small town of Donghae in eastern South Korea. As you may know, obviously, South Korea is the eastern end of the Eurasian supercontinent. And from here, by land, in effect, you should be able to go to China, onwards up into Mongolia, Russia, and all the way through to Europe. But due to the situation between the South and the North, South Korea actually, in effect, is a bit like an island on the edge of the Eurasian continent, a bit like neighboring Japan, because you cannot get anywhere by land. And the only connection out of South Korea is by either plane or boat. 
And Donghae is actually the biggest port town here in eastern South Korea. And from here, we're actually going to be getting a boat to another country, which is going to be in the next video. But we thought for the end of this video, we just wanted to have a look around Donghae itself and just explore a little bit of what small town life is like here in South Korea. And um, yeah, this is supposed to be a really beautiful place. There's beautiful beaches here, as well as the port and lots of nice seafood. So um, yeah, let's check it out. Look at the beach. I love seas like that in the cold weather. Just walking around, smelling the air. Mm. This, apart from the sandy beach, reminds me a lot actually of the English coast. Yeah. Right, that sort of mean, grim vibe about it, but <laughs> beautiful it. at the same time. Yeah, so beautiful. One thing we've noticed doing this walk along the coast here is aside from it being very beautiful, every viewpoint we've got to, there's always been one of these um, army lookout posts, literally on every hill along the coast here, which obviously with Donghae and Mukho, the other side of the city being a strategic port, uh, is here to protect the port itself, I guess, in times of, of trouble. Apple? Apple. Yeah, we got apple. given apples. <laughs> There's two two people that were working in an allotment just up the top of the hill and they were packing up apples to take to the market or something to sell. And um, yeah, we went up and asked if we could buy free apples and they insisted on just giving them to us. Yes, <laughs> Is it? Squid? Yep. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. mm. Should we grab a couple? <laughs> oh, look at those chilies. Wow. It seems like it's not only the port city, which is obviously, which obviously means that people fish here a lot, but we've seen people having so many allotments and just grow things everywhere around here. <laughs> wow. Oh, they're huge. Oh, the king. He looks like a king. Oh, I don't know. That's so scary. Russia. 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 Russia is a taboo. Oh, Russia. Ah, from Russia. Okay. Sure. What? It's a Russian crab. On the boat. Привет. Red crab. Wow. Wow. Oh, wow, look at that. 
If only we could pass smells. Wow. Hey, Mazel. This is insane. And Sammy there. Yeah. And Sammy there. I'm fascinated how they change colour. Mm -hmm. There's so much person. Oh. 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 I haven't seen anything like that before. I'm so easily impressed. <laughs> I don't know, with that smell though, the, the look of it, I don't know if that's easily impressed or it is just incredible. This is the fish market. Now, can you see those massive snails? Oh my god. Oh, what is this? What is this? Ikra. Looks amazing. Sounds probably. I gotta taste good. It smells so There are two ports here, Donhei and Muho, and we're in Muho now where the smaller boats go. And there is a fish market here, and we're hoping there are some cafes or restaurants where we can grab some food. It smells really good. Looks like England. It does. There's a, a real similarity to the English coast, mm -hmm. isn't there? Mm -hmm. To places down on like the Kent, Sussex coast that yep. we used to. It's got that same vibe, the same smells. I love it. I love places like this. Meat the sea. seagulls uh -huh. and they they are meaty seagulls as well. Oh. The same as the gobniks in England. I them. There's a, one of my favourite stories. My favourite memories was the first week, the first time when you came to England when you moved and we the first time we went to Brighton. Mm -hmm. And obviously it's tradition that in on the English seaside you have to get fish and chips. And I was saying to Julie all the time, we're going to get fish and chips today, we're going to get fish and chips. Mm -hmm. We got our fish and chips, took them out of the, uh, of the shop, walked across onto the beautiful Brighton beach, where we sat down on a grey day looking over the pier and looking over the English Channel. And got As mugged. soon as we sat down, we got mugged. All these seagulls swooped down. One of them literally pinched our fish. The other one took a load of <laughs> chips. The rest of them went flying. It was chaos. So and that, we were on the way. Yeah, we were on the way. That was your first introduction to the English seaside. And that's <laughs> how I realised that I hate seagulls. That's the story. <laughs> that's the moral of the story. The colour of this water is just so beautiful. Oh, the so Okay. 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 Okay.
There's all sorts of fish in this dish. Some gochujang, vegetables. Look at that. I wonder what this is. I have no idea. No idea what the fish is. It looks good. It looks amazing. Cheers. Is that the wrong way? Mm -hmm. So fresh. So creamy, so fresh. Mm. The rice and the vegetables just cut through it as well. And the gochujang's not too spicy, is it? Oh, it's kind of sweet. Yeah. Mmm. It's so, so good. As we finish our last meal in South Korea, we start reflecting on an eye-opening period of time here. This won't be the last time we visit this Korean peninsula for sure, but tomorrow we are taking a ship out into the Sea of Japan and waving this land goodbye. Make sure to check back for the next video, it's going to be a wild ride. If you would like to get more exclusive content from us like daily vlogs and other travel vlogs that we don't put on YouTube, you may want to check out our Patreon community where we post our future plans and loads more other different things. And if you would like to get your name on the credit section here and just support our channel. On that note, thanks for watching this video and see you in the next one. Mwah.